Welcome to the second hour of Bloomberg Go. I'm going to guarantee something. It is about to be a big one. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie <laughs> It's Rule. very exciting. And I'm David West, and I want to welcome a very special guest. He's Walt Disney, of course, CEO, President, and Chairman, Bob Iger. Thank you very much for being here, Bob. Good to be here, David. Stephanie? Thank you. So, Bob, we have to start with Star Wars. Everybody else's New York Times front page is. You know it's big. We know it's big. How big is it, and is it bigger than you thought it would be? Yes, it's, uh, it's, big, it's bigger than big. It's bigger than we thought it would be yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, we came out with estimates for the weekend at 238 million domestic and over 500 million uh, total global box office. And Sunday, yesterday, ended up stronger than we anticipated. And so it's more likely to be in the 247 range domestically and even higher international. So we expect that uh, the total global take for the weekend could be in the neighborhood of $528 million. And China has yet to open. So that's, that's an incredible weekend. And, and, and I oh, must say, it's, high, it's higher than we said yesterday. Well, put that in perspective, what that could do to your business strategy next year. Because with those numbers, that equals more than 15% that Disney Buena Vista Studio will take in all year. Is this going to change what you want to do next year, seeing how impactful this is? No. <laughs> no, I, our strategy is kind of baked in, certainly for 2016. And particularly on the movie side, where we've got a slate all planned and most of the films finished shooting, in some cases in varying stages of editing. So it doesn't really change things that much. What this really does is it sets this great franchise up for far more value creation over a longer period of time for the company. Yeah, uh, take us into that, because this is more than just a movie. It is quite a movie, but it's more than just a movie. Yeah. Take us There's into a lot the... of lunch boxes that are well, Exactly. <laughs> well, take us through, because you've been through some version of this before with Frozen and a number of these. Um, take us through the revenue stream, and when does it hit going out, whether it's merchandising or theme park incremental or spin-offs or whatever? Well, Star Wars really is more than a movie. Uh, and you touched upon other what we call franchises of the company. Um, Star Wars, I've said a number of times, I think is probably the most valuable, maybe even the most Im important uh, mythology created in our time. And while it was introduced by George Lucas in 1977 as a movie, and then five other movies ensued, so there were six that George created, uh, it was always bigger than that. It spawned books and games and all sorts of consumer products and theme park attractions. So when we acquired Lucas in 2012, while we knew that the most important thing that we had to do was to make good films, starting with this one, uh, that it was always going to represent for the company more than just a movie and more than just a movie business. Um, and so as we look ahead, there's a lot of activity that is Star Wars related at the company, including large theme park lands and many other plans across our businesses the and, pressure, and across territories. The pressure was on taking the rein from George, but you're also changing the narrative. The fact that many of us think of Star Wars as a boy franchise, mm -hmm. that's changing. With a central character based around a woman, a strong woman who may or may not be the daughter of Luke Skywalker, if you'd like to tell us, we would love to know. <laughs> uh, what are you trying to tell us? What are you trying to change about the Star Wars story? Well, the first thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to spoil this great movie-going experience for anyone. So I come to this set today as disciplined as possible, yes. not to reference anything. What I will say is that J.J. Abrams and the writers of this fine film uh, created new characters, uh, one of them a woman who's played by Daisy Ridley. Her name is Ray. I'm not giving anything away yet, and I don't actually I don't intend to. Uh, and she is very much a central character in this film, which is fantastic because it, it does open up Star Wars to a broader audience. And what we actually have been seeing since the movie opened on Thursday night in the United States is word of mouth, particularly among women and young people, has been extraordinary. And so the audience has actually gotten more diverse as the weekend progressed. So it started very male, which Star Wars was. But as people heard more and more about the story itself in the film, uh, it, it, they ended up wanting to see the film themselves, and the result, I think, is, you know, one, one of the reasons why we're seeing the results as high as they are is just because of that. So, so I used to work for you, 
And so I know how disciplined and thoughtful the Walt Disney Company is as they plan out these strategies. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us some sense of what this franchise means for the Walt Disney Company in the out years, next year, three years out, five years out? It, and how material is it? Because you're a very big company. It's hard to be material in your company. We are a big company. Something of this size has materiality, of course. How big, I can't say. What I can say is that after Force Awakens, we, which is the seventh of the Star Wars films, we intend to make eight and nine. Eight actually will be, we'll start shooting after the first of the year, sometime in, uh, in uh, Jan late January. And nine after that, we have a director for nine as well. And we're also making some standalone films. So there are five, including this, there are five Star Wars films in the works, either written, shot, uh, about to be shot, about to be developed in some advanced form. That's a lot of activity. Plus two big theme park lands, one in California, Disneyland, and one in Florida and Orlando. And in all likelihood, there will be Star Wars lands at our other park locations around the world. It's a huge business for our consumer products business, merchandise. How it big? always was one of the largest, if not the largest, that exists in terms of um, uh, what we call consumer products. Uh, and it's larger than we even estimated. And then we have a really strong program licensing games, including to EA and, um, and, and, and television, and plans for a lot more. But I, I can't estimate. Only, I can only say that with a very, very successful and a high quality first film that bodes extremely well for not, not just what's ahead creatively, but what's ahead commercially. Can you give us any sense relative to the two other major acquisitions you've made? Because you did Pixar very early on in your tenure, yes. uh, and then you did Marvel somewhat later. And they both share some uh, similarities with this. I mean, they generate great content, and they can be used throughout your franchise, as you call them. Uh, is this bigger than those two? How does it compare in size? Well, it's about the size of Marvel from an acquisition uh, price perspective, and Pixar was a few billion dollars higher. In terms of value today, it's not something that we really break out, so I can't say. What I can say is, and you touched on it, David, they do have a lot of things in common. And it's, it starts with great storytelling. That is the heart, really, of the company. It's going all the way back to 1923 when it was founded by Walt Disney and his brother Roy. It's all about storytelling. That's what creates the most value. So we had in Pixar some of the best storytellers that existed in motion pictures and certainly the best in animation. We had in Marvel stories and characters, great storytelling, and obviously with George Lucas's uh, Star Wars. And Indiana Jones, by the way, as well, which will be coming. We have more great stories. And I think in a world where there's far more content or intellectual property and much more choice. Great stories still hold their value and actually stand out given all the choice that people have. Given the power of those franchises, when you say Marvel or an Indiana Jones or Star Wars, how hard will it be going forward to green light big budget projects that aren't known franchises? Well, we'll have a blend. Um, I did love Inside Out. It, Inside Out is a good example. It's still important to invent fresh stories, either fresh stories for older franchises or existing franchises, or just fresh stories that are not tied to anything that exists today. And Inside Out is a great example of that. There's nothing better than a great original story. And we'll continue to do that. It's riskier than deriving stories from the known than the unknown. But it's, a, it's important for us to continue to do. It's important for the creative people that work for us to continue to, to continue to do. But it's also a risk and a challenge to take the reins from a creative genius like George Lucas, whose audience has extraordinarily high standards. That was a risk. You know, I, I didn't really look at it as a risk. I, I looked at it more as a responsibility. And it was admittedly a heavy burden in that regard. <laughs> because you're taking something that I think in many respects is a crown jewel in yeah. terms of storytelling. We talked about mythology. And by placing it in our hands, that puts a huge burden or responsibility on us, not only to honor the legacy that is George Lucas and Star Wars, but all of the fans around the world that have you know, such a love for, for Star Wars. So, so Bob, when we have CEOs on, we like to 
turn to the Bloomberg and take a look at how their stock has done. So Matt has got a chart here to reveal. You can turn around and look at it if you want. I actually have charted uh, Disney's stock performance since Bob took over as CEO <laughs> in, I believe, October of 2005. Uh, and I've graphed Walt Disney's stock in white versus the S&P and uh, consumer discretionary uh, stocks here, although you could choose another number of other benchmarks. It's interesting if you uh, reinvest all dividends in all three, uh, in the two indexes and the stock, uh, Disney has outperformed the S&P by 323% since 2000, 2005. So not a bad track record. Uh, you know, if you look at the stock um, year to date, it's still up about... I'd say 15% right now, equity GPYTD. Uh, and you can see uh, it's up from year to date, but it has come down substantially from the August high of uh, 120, 122. Yeah, so, so, Bob, we have to talk about August, September, because uh, the Disney stock did come down mm -hmm. significantly. And it was tied, at least in most people's reporting, to ESPN and possible loss of subscribers. You want to describe that for us? ESPN, that's still, by the way, crushes it. I mean, it still crushes <laughs> yes, it. It's fairly successful, but it's still. It was tied to comments that uh, we made when we announced earnings in August, uh, when we talked about the television ecosystem, and in particular the multi-channel television universe, and specifically talked about the fact that we had seen some sub-losses that I believe I described as either moderate or, 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 or uh, relatively small in nature. But just the fact that I talked about it in a, in a candid way, um, I think created a fair amount of um, concern, if you want to call it that. And it obviously had an impact on our stock price and the, and, and the stock of a number of other media companies. But do you think the concern is less about the power and strength of ESPN? Because ESPN is clearly on top and it doesn't look like that's going to change for the foreseeable future. But in terms of programming the power of live events for years we've said this is the thing everyone cares about so could the, the negative response really be how it's going to affect all those below you who really are in a more vulnerable position well that's an interesting point I thought first of all there was an overreaction to what we had said but you know the market is the market we certainly have very little control over that um, it's clear that Television is experiencing some disruptive forces, shall we say? Lord knows what, uh, what impact just calling it disruptive forces <laughs> will have. But it's clear that that's happening. There's just so much more competition, so much more choice for people's time, how they spend their money, how they spend their leisure time. And that's putting pressure on television uh, to be great, obviously, and to be of great value, meaning the price-to-value relationship has to be great, and the user experience must be great. I happen to believe that if you're, if you're in a market that is being disrupted, you, you obviously want the best products if, that are out there in a disrupted market, and we believe we have that at the company, including obviously ESPN. If you're in a, in a market that is changing, you'd rather be with strength, uh, rather have a very strong hand. And so I've said, What's better than ESPN in that regard? I agree. The value of live is really important. The licensed um, sports that ESPN has, the original programming that they do, the brand value, the allegiance from fans, which is, by the way, short for fanatic, um, <laughs> that's, I think, really important, and it positions ESPN extremely well, even in a market that's being disrupted. And so we feel long-term ESPN will be just fine. But we refuse to have our head in the sand or be Pollyannish um, about what we're seeing in the marketplace. And others may be seeing things differently, but we believe that uh, there's disruption going on and there's more disruption ahead. And we're spending a fair amount of time making sure we're well positioned in that market. Obviously, ESPN um, is, we believe, uh, something of great value even in this disrupted world. But David, note that Bob said disruptive forces, because even then, he's selling you on the force being with you. <laughs> I promise you I'm not. There you go. Bob. That was subliminally in there. <laughs> but Bob, there are many who believe that the, the linear cable business is reaching maturity. It had grew through the 90s into the aughts. And now, even though it's not falling apart, not falling off a cliff, the growth potential is limited. And for a company like Walt Disney Company, which relies significantly on ESPN for your operating income, what can you do to replace that growth, assuming that you agree that you need to replace it? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that, uh, to what you said, David, that it is a business that's relatively mature, the multi-channel television business. 
Um, and so you're not going to see you know, growth in, in households that's anything close to what the, mark, the business experienced over the last decade or two decades. There's some pricing leverage. There's still some prices, price increases that can and will be taken, certainly by the best channels, in my opinion. Uh, but it's not going to grow anything close to. So we, we by the way, we, we believe we'll continue to see some growth yes. in that business, but it won't grow at the rate that we saw in the past. As a company, we're fairly diversified. We've looked globally. The investments that we're making in China is a great example of that, with Shanghai Disneyland opening in 2016. We've grown our studio business significantly. We've been talking about Star Wars and Marvel and Pixar. The impact of, those, of that business across the rest of our businesses in terms of growth creation is also profound. Consumer products are a great example of that. So we feel as a company we're not growth deprived at all in terms of opportunity, even though we're definitely seeing much more moderate growth at ESPN. So as you look forward, you believe that you'll be able to replace whatever modification of growth, moderation of growth you have in ESPN, you'll be able to replace with these other initiatives? We don't give guidance, so I can't be specific with you except to say that we're bullish on the growth prospects of the Walt Disney Company because of the intellectual property, the franchises, the brands, that we talked about because of the global footprint and the fact that we're seeing developments in markets that are creating opportunities for us. China is a great example. So I talked about Star Wars and, and the, the numbers earlier. China doesn't open until January 9th. That is not, how big could China be? Well, it's now the in, number... For, in terms of Star Wars. It's the number two movie market in the world. It will become the number one movie market in the world in a few years, so, sooner than everybody anticipated. Uh, that's a huge opportunity that did not exist a few years ago. So as we look at the world, you look at either um, the Star Wars franchise or our movie business, suddenly there's a market that developed to, to, to address your growth question, David, that didn't exist before. And so it creates a growth opportunity for us that we're positioned to take advantage of. Let me ask one more question about ESPN. How important is direct-to-consumer mm. for ESPN's future? Well, we believe in the multi-channel model, and we believe that it's not only not going away, but uh, predictions about its demise were, we think, overstated. Um, that said, we talked about growth being limited in, in many respects, or, or, or more limited than before. We think at some point, if that business model were to fall apart, there are opportunities to go direct to consumer. In our case, with ESPN, with the Disney brand, possibly with, with, with Pixar and Marvel, and certainly with Star Wars. You said earlier the best channels. Do you think there's too much content out there and some could actually fall away in the coming years? I, you know, I, I like the hand that we have with Disney and ABC it's a good one. and ESPN. <laughs> so I, I, I'd prefer if, again, if you're facing some sort of disruptive forces or headwinds, you want to have the, the highest, you want to, you want to own the, the, the highest quality and the best brands, and, and we believe we do. Bob's okay. playing with a good hand. He is, <laughs> and we're going to come back and talk with him more about it next on Bloomberg Go. Welcome back to Bloomberg Go, here with Bob Iger of Disney. Disney Shanghai, you've been working on this project since 1999. You've been doing business in China since 1994. We haven't seen it open yet. We don't know the date. But talk to us about the health of the economy there. We talk so much about the data we get out of there. But the more and more business people we speak to who are actually on the ground, they are bullish. They watch this transformation to a consumer-based economy. Do you agree? I do agree. We're very bullish on China. Uh, we actually believe that uh, the Chinese consumer is, um, is still spending, and, and, they, and the Chinese consumer represents, as far as we're concerned, a great market for our company. So we're building Shanghai Disneyland. It's scheduled to open sometime in the spring. We will announce a, an opening date sometime after the first of the year. And, um, you know, we believe that we're bringing a product that's not only high quality but very unique to that market and that the Chinese, and it will be in demand, you know, among Chinese consumers. But has there been any sort of slowdown? Even though it's a high demand and you're bullish, have you tempered that optimism in any way over the last six months? No, we haven't. Our, our business profile there today is largely consumer products and motion picture. 
and neither of those businesses have shown any signs whatsoever of slowing down uh, since all the news has come out about the Chinese economy. So you're still dealing with a huge population base and some growth and spendable income and urbanization. And so when, when you uh, look at Shanghai as a for instance and put a Disneyland there in Pudong, uh, you have access to a huge, huge population base hundreds of millions of people, over 300 million people will be able to travel to Shanghai Disneyland within a three and a half hour trip, interestingly enough. Or, you know, that's really quite a large consumer base, and so we're bullish. There must be particular challenges, though, to doing business at that scale inside China. That's not the same as a consumer products business. To make that sort of capital investment, what are the special challenges? There are challenges. There are challenges, actually. Any, anywhere in the world that you try to build something that is that large, you'll have challenges. Uh, in China, you know, we've had a, a number of challenges. We're bringing a product to market, meaning what we're actually constructing that's very unique. The structures that we build in a theme park are extremely complex. They're not just buildings, but they're shows and they're rides. And there, has, there aren't that many examples of the Chinese construction industry building things that are as complex as what we're building. So I'd say that's really been the biggest challenge. It's getting it right because what we're building is so complex. But we feel very good about where we are today. And I said, we'll open in the spring and you know, the rest will be history. <laughs> the Magic Bands technology, the seamless pay that you rolled out in Orlando that was successful, but also a big investment. Will we see that in Shanghai, or has Apple Pay, mobile payments kind of made that obsolete? What you'll see in Shanghai is a park that, from a technological perspective, is more advanced than anything we've ever built. That will show up in the attractions themselves, but it'll also show up in commerce or you know, B2C or C2B transactions. So the consumer will be able to uh, buy their tickets, use their mobile devices in far more advanced, compelling ways than any other place that, from a theme park perspective that we are today. So Friday was a big uh, day because of the premiere of Star Wars. There was another little event that happened that affected your stock price. There was smaller one, than one, Star Wars. <laughs> smaller than Star Wars, but still an analyst came out with a report that expressed some skepticism involving ESPN in large part. Um, uh, I wonder what your reaction to that report has been. Well, I was uh, curious or suspicious about the timing. If anybody wanted headlines, the time to do it was the morning after Star Wars opened in the United States. And so it was headline grabbing. The analyst that came out with that report has been wrong about us on a number of occasions. And so one would have to question if he's been wrong so often before, you know, how valid were his comments well, then how this time around. And by the way, he's entitled, he's entitled to his opinions. And the other thing I would say is I don't know where the accountability is. I don't know when, when he's wrong. I don't know who he's accountable for. But the, the, nothing has changed, and we've got nothing to update since our last filing, our last earnings call regarding ESPN. So, again, he's entitled to his opinions. I, you know. Address for us one specific point I thought I understood him to make, which is you have long-term commitments, substantial commitments on the sports right side. But don't go around their fixed costs, and you've got the variable costs of, of subs going down, and that you're caught in a squeeze. Well, first of all, we <clears throat> made a decision to license those that sports product that that you refer to in the NFL and Major League Baseball and the NBA and the college football championships, to name a few. F you know, for one main reason, that is to serve the ESPN fan well, and really to um, essentially perpetuate, I guess, a, 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 um, a competitive advantage that ESPN has and to continue to support the strength of its brand and the consumer proposition that it makes. And so we haven't second-guessed that at all. Our cable fees are going up per subscriber, but as I said and we have said, we have lost some subscribers. We believe we will continue to derive growth from ESPN. It just will not be at the rate that we saw before. Matt, take us in the terminal. Yeah, well, you guys were talking about theme parks, so I wanted to see how much money Disney makes from theme parks. Everybody knows that the media networks and ESPN make a lot of money here. Uh, the blue here is movies, studio production. So I think it's surprising that theme parks, which are here in yellow, uh, make so much more money. And what I'm wondering is, obviously, Star Wars will be a huge boon. I know you have big rides coming out in uh, L.A. and Orlando. But how much do uh, dwindling gas prices, lower prices at the fuel pump, put money in consumers' pockets and drive them to theme parks and, and have them uh, buying Mickey ears? 
Well, we haven't seen much correlation between uh, oil prices or gasoline prices and theme park visitation. Really? And so when, when uh, gas was high, a lot of people were bearish about us because they worried that the consumer wouldn't go to our parks because it cost a lot of money to drive there or because they had less discretionary uh, income to spend because they were spending so much more on gasoline. We didn't see a correlation there. And so now we're being asked, now that gas is cheaper, are we seeing a reverse correlation right. another, and we have not. It's, there's nothing bad about it's for yeah, us about Disney, prices being low. I drive there, or when I was, you know, said a man with no children who goes to Disney. It's a, big, well, well, it's a blend. Drive me no matter what. It's a blend. People drive, people fly. Now I guess the cost of flying goes up if fuel goes up, or can. But we haven't seen a correlation. Bob, let's those, those are revenue but, numbers. How about something? These are revenue numbers. Yes. Hold on. What about something else that might keep people out of parks? Security. People are more and more concerned today about bringing their families to places of interest where there are large amounts of people. How are you addressing this issue? Well, we take security very, very seriously, and it's not just the safety and well-being of our guests, it's the safety and well-being of our cast members or our employees, as we say. And so we've taken a number of steps. I don't need to be specific about it. Actually, I, I I prefer not to be, but we've taken a number of steps over the last decade, but even very recently, to increase safety and security at our parks because it's obviously a world that is just more threatened than it's ever been. How much are you affected by the strong dollar, whether theme parks or other parts of your business? We <clears throat> haven't seen that much of an effect uh, on, in terms of the strong dollar, other than obviously we have some foreign exchange issues that impact our bottom line globally, and we've talked about that particularly as it relates to 2016. Uh, but the, th the person who wants to visit the United States and to go, or to go to a theme park, particularly Orlando, um, is not holding back because of the value of their currency versus the value of the dollar. Just we haven't seen that. You know, you mentioned earlier about an industry, television, being disrupted. In terms of leading your company, Extraordinary CEOs have to be disrupting themselves before activists come knocking on their door. As you look to your business line, your 2016 outlook, what business units in your universe do you feel need to be disrupted that you need to be focused on? Not necessarily reinventing, but retuning. Well, I, the, the word disruption, and I know I totally use Totally overused. I know, <laughs> I, I, it, it is a, I know I used it earlier as it related to television. We happen to believe that we have to continue to innovate, which is to do business differently. That is to what we create, how we create it, how we distribute it, how we market it. The world is very, very dynamic. It's a marketplace that I think is changing more rapidly than certainly I've ever seen in my now 41-year career. And with that comes a demand to, to look at things differently. We happen to believe that we're better off disrupting ourselves before we are disrupted. But making a decision as to when to do that, you know, is, you know, it, you ha it takes time and you have to be very, very thoughtful about that, particularly as it relates to the TV business. But many big companies, as, are, you know, are being disrupted by technology upstarts because when you're a massive business, it's very difficult to move I don't want to say that Titanic, to move a tanker, and you're a very large company. How do you stay relevant and ahead of the game when so many are getting, I look at the financial industry and how they're getting hit. Well, that's a really good question. And actually, when I, when I got this job in 2005, I, I, I actually um, focused on three major strategic priorities. One we've talked about a lot, which is intellectual property, basically high quality branded storytelling. And that gave birth to the acquisitions of Pixar and Marvel and, and Lucasfilm and Star Wars. I also believe that technology was critical, that we had to embrace technology. And while it was creating challenges for us because of consumer uh, behavioral change, we had to view it as more opportunity than threat. Embrace it, bring it in, use it. And the third priority was growing globally. And I think Shanghai Disneyland and the movie business in China is a great example of that. But it's a very, very important to view technology um, as, a, as an opportunity because, first of all, you can't will it away. It's, it's a way of the world. And it is changing the behavior of consumers. 
what they buy, how they buy it, when they buy it, how things are priced. I mean, there's so many different directions you could look at. Competition, created more competition, for instance. Take us into 2016 for the Walt Disney Company and beyond. For that matter. What are the big projects that you're excited about, whether it's technology or theme parks or movies, what are you really excited about? I'm trying to absorb this little film that we've, we've just <laughs> come out of and, and, um, and appreciate it a little bit, but uh, the biggest priority for us in 2016 is Shanghai Disneyland as a company, but we have a very, very strong movie slate uh, on the Disney front, on the Pixar front. We have a sequel to Finding Nemo called Finding Dory. We've got a sequel to Captain America at Marvel on Captain America 3, Civil War, by the way. Uh, we've got a number of great uh, Disney films coming out, including a, a, a remake of Jungle Book as a live-action movie and uh, Alice in Wonderland 2, for instance. Uh, we've got a lot going on in the TV universe. ESPN will you know, continue to move itself forward. We're looking forward to the college football playoffs, as a friend. And so there are a lot of priorities as a company. But I'd say, f certainly for me, Shanghai, Disney loom, uh, Shanghai Disneyland looms the largest. So Stephanie talked about technology, and I know you've always been an early adopter. Netflix has been a technology. I get up early, too, by the way. <laughs> no, he, he isn't wearing an Apple Watch, though. <laughs> I'm not today, and usually I do, particularly when I'm on TV, because I'm on the Apple board. And, and I, I go. And, and, <laughs> but I, I didn't grab it this morning. It's so, an oversight. So, so talk about uh, t uh, Netflix. Is Netflix a friend or a foe? Netflix has been a, an aggressive buyer of our product. And in our case, we sell really three types of product to them. We sell off-network, uh, for instance, programs that have been on ABC as a for instance, uh, not in season, but you know, past seasons. We make original programming for them. They're making some, we're actually producing them. They're buying some fantastic Marvel series. The latest one was called Jessica Jones, or AKA Jessica Jones, Daredevil last year. And they have an output deal for, for our movies, our movie product, uh, starting with product that we uh, release next year. So they've been great to us as a buyer. And that's actually interesting because we've talked about a lot of disruption. We've talked a lot about a lot of competition. But what technology has also enabled is the birth of new platforms, which some may view as competitive. In some cases, they are. But they can also be additive in terms of our business. And actually, Netflix has been for the Walt Disney Company. Long term, w we believe that they'll continue to be aggressive buyers. They'll also compete with us because time is finite for people. And if they're spending time using Netflix, that may be time they're not spending watching some of our other channels. But it also could be that they're spending time on Netflix consuming our product. Well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I'd say, you know, we, we look at them carefully in the sense that you know, we want to see where things settle down in terms of the, I'll call it the, the, compl the competitive uh, nature of the relationship. But short term and, and maybe mid term, they're, they're more friend than foe because, of, um, because they're a great customer of, of what we make. You mentioned being on the board of Apple. When we look at the 2016 pipeline, are we going to see a Disney-Apple collaboration at some point? Tim Cook has been pretty outspoken about Apple TV and feeling like the TV experience could be much better. I agree with Tim Cook on that, by the way. When we talk about disruption, we talk about competition. One of the most important things that the industry needs to do is demand a better consumer experience. And I actually believe that the Apple TV box, this may sound like a blatant commercial, uh, for Apple, but the Apple TV box and the interface that it provides is the best user experience I've seen ever for television users. And I think that's actually, as an um, intellectual property creator or as a content creator, that's great news for us. In terms of co cooperation, collaboration, we've got a great relationship as a company with Apple and we fully expect that will continue. So take us into the future for Bob Iger. What's next for Ooh. you and when? <laughs> well, NFL? After Shanghai. Uh, <laughs> After Shanghai. Well, I, I, I will be CEO and, and chairman of the Walt Disney Company through sometime in 2018 when I fully intend to leave the company. Um, I don't expect that decision will change. I've been involved with trying to move two NFL teams to Los Angeles, the Raiders and the Chargers. I'm very excited about that. I think it's great for the, it would be great for the NFL to bring an NFL team back to Los Angeles. And I think it'll be great for Los Angeles to have one. Um, so I'm working on that kind of as a, you know, a, 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 you know on the side, yeah, so yeah. to speak. Does that mean there's a future for you with the NFL? 
Well, if uh, uh, the league uh, determines that these two teams can move, I'll have some involvement with them, but I don't, in, I don't expect that it will become full-time. And I, I really don't know. Right now, I'm, 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 I'm fully committed to and concentrating on uh, the Walt Disney Company, which, as you cited earlier, is large and complex and has many moving parts and, and, and demands a lot of my time. I have but then to he'll ask be in you. trouble. Who's he going to root for? <laughs> the Chargers of the Rams. I, <laughs> I have to ask you, public office, would you rule it out? You have to talk to my wife about that. <laughs> Every time I talk about possibly running for office, she says, not with this wife. There you go. <laughs> there she got me to smile. As far as I'm concerned, that's that an might, answer. That's a complete answer. That might not have to do with you running for office. Though. It doesn't necessarily yeah. rule it out. But. Okay. So, Bob Iger, thank you very much for joining us today. More Bloomberg Go ahead.